Um, good morning, everybody. It's, it's really lovely to be um, in a room, not just a room as pleasant as this one, but a room as energized as, as this one is. Um, it's a timely gathering, if, if nothing else. Um, we live in times that are both extraordinarily unpredictable and extremely predictable. The unpredictability lies in the fact that a phrase that maybe even two years ago most of us might have used in an optimistic way, anything can happen, uh, has now become a pretty terrifying kind of phrase. You know, we, we, we realize that we're in a period in human history when the unthinkable has to be thought, when it is possible for us to see the reversal of many things that we took for granted in terms of the development of human civilization. Uh, we can go back to a kind of brutal atavism very, very quickly. And we realized in the course of that just how fragile democracy itself is. And this period is one that is going to produce these extraordinarily unpredictable events. It's not accidental that opinion polls, for example, which are in the business of prediction, uh, are becoming increasingly useless because we simply don't know what the public mood is. We don't know where anything is going. And yet, the key thing, I think, to understand is that this, un <coughs> this unpredictability is itself entirely predictable. The state to which we have arrived in our democracies is one that is not just predictable, but predicted. Why? Because it happened before. What we know from history, and anybody who has any sense of modern history understands that something uh, will flow from a feral form of capitalism. If you allow a kind of market fundamentalism which says that the key thing is to let it rip, let money accumulate uh, in the hands of a small oligarchy of people, uh, let the sort of wild energy of the building of bubble economies, uh, let that rip, um, don't worry about the consequences, don't worry about what happens to people who are the losers in this process. We know that if you do that, then you cannot have democracy. And we know this because it's happened before. There was a long period in the 1920s when you had exactly the same kind of attitudes that we've had governing Western society since the Reagan-Thatcher revolution in late 1978, 1979. In a sense, the only strange thing is it's taken so long for these consequences to become so apparent. But just as we know that this particular form of feral capitalism uh, challenges democracy in really fundamental ways, we also know what you need to do about it. Because again, history points us towards the lessons that were learned in the most appalling and painful ways. In the 1930s in the United States, there was a realization that democracy itself, including a form of market capitalism, was not possible. It could not sustain itself without social democracy. They didn't call it social democracy in the United States, they called it the New Deal. But what it was, was government moving in to say that you must have a society in which the collective dignity of the society is predicated on the individual dignity of every individual. And this cannot just be an abstract aspiration. It has to be a concrete set of guarantees to the individual from the collective. It's social democracy. And equally, at the end of the Second World War, when human civilization had reached probably its most abysmal point in, in fascism, in Nazism, in the Holocaust, in the Second World War. It was obvious to people, it was obvious on a very wide level that we have to say, this cannot be allowed to happen again. And the answer to not allowing it to happen again was pretty obvious, it was social democracy. Because there was an analysis that was shared by most people that said you cannot afford a way of organizing your economy and your society 
which emphasizes a kind of reckless anarchic individualism at the expense of collective dignity. And you can't afford it, not just because it's ethically and morally wrong. You can't afford it because if you do it, then those lines of WB8s will come to pass. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. The center cannot hold because people in a democracy need to be centered on certain basic guarantees about what it means to be a human being in a democratic society. And as a result of those perceptions, social democracy became the mainstream of, 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 of European thinking. The European Union was founded around those basic values. The rebuilding of Europe after the catastrophe of the Holocaust and the Second World War was built around those basic values. And social democracy is, it's an unusual way of thinking. Uh, it became very mainstream and it became taken for granted. But actually now that it is not mainstream and it is not ta taken for granted, we can think about how unusual it is in a sense. Because it asks us to do two things mentally, to hold two things in our heads at the same time. One is fear and the other is hope, which seem to be opposites. Uh, social democracy, in a sense, is built on fear. Uh, it may seem to be a very negative thing to say, but it's built on a certain kind of fear. So, so what social democracy goes back to is that great statement by Roosevelt, FDR, in, in promulgating the New Deal to the American people. What he said is, we have nothing to fear except fear itself. Social democrats are afraid of fear. Why? Because they recognize that actually if you get a fearful society, if you have large numbers of people in your society, society who are waking up afraid, afraid that they're going to be homeless, afraid that they're going to fall into poverty, afraid they're going to lose their job, afraid that all of the things that they've struggled for, for themselves and their families to achieve a certain level of dignity, if they wake up every day afraid of losing those kinds of things, then society as a whole should be very afraid of that situation because it's a situation in which democracy itself becomes untenable. Why? Because fear is a corrosive emotion. People who are afraid start to look for somebody to blame and they, their fears are exploitable. And this is not obviously an abstract proposition right now. We've just seen one of the most extraordinary examples of this, of the way in which the fear of people who do not have a sense of basic security can be manipulated in the most negative and dangerous and damaging ways. So social democracy really goes back to that sort of basic perception of Roosevelt's. We, we have to fear fear. We have to be afraid of having a society in which too many people are dominated by their fears rather than by their hopes. And so what social democracy says is that actually these fears can be dealt with. They have to be acknowledged. We, we have to take them extremely seriously. We have to have a sense of urgency about them. We have to sympathize with the people who are afraid. And we have to be able to say to them, but you don't need to be afraid. It is possible to build a society in which people don't wake up in the morning with that really fundamental sense of insecurity. And we know what constitutes security. We know what the basic things are that every human being needs in order to lead a dignified existence. Social democracy, you know, in policy terms, it can become very complex, but in human terms, it's based around an idea of dignity. And it actually asks the fundamental question, what is it that every individual needs in order to lead a dignified life? And it says, let's place that at the center of public policy, of, of governance, of the way in which we conduct ourselves collectively. And we know what it is. It's, there's nothing, nothing really has changed in human history about what people need in order to lead a dignified life. Right? They, they need uh, a sense of economic security. You know, they need to feel that actually they have opportunity, they can, they can, they can contribute to the society, they can work, they can, they can use their talents, and they can get reasonably decently rewarded for doing so. They need to have access 
to healthcare. They need the, you know, a lot, the big, huge fear that so many people have, as, particularly as they get older, is you know, if I get sick, my whole life is going to fall apart because there's no, there's no safety net there for me. There's nothing to protect me. Or in, in our society, if I get sick, what kind of indignity am I going to be subject to just to get treatment? They need to have access to education, you know, to their own uh, potential development. And they need to feel that they have that access equally to everybody else, right? That education is a public good which is, which is there for people. And education is not confined just to the formal education system. It's a lifelong process of imagination, of creativity, of engagement. It includes, and I'm really pleased to see that one of the key documents that the Social Democrats have outside here is a document about the arts. It includes people's access to art, to creativity, to the dignity that comes from not just being a consumer of other people's ideas and images, but being able to actually produce and engage in those things yourself. Uh, people need a home, you know, home, that, that fundamental sense of security that people have comes from a sense of having a place in the world. And it's not abstract, you know, it's actually about having somewhere to live, it's about having a community in which you can locate yourself, in which you can connect, uh, in which you can feel some sense of basic security. And finally, the fifth thing, it's about, it's about equality, you know, in the fundamental democratic sense. It's about being an equal citizen. Your dignity as a person comes from your sense that, you know, I am the absolute equal of everybody else in my society. Uh, it's expressed beautifully by the Irish political philosopher Philip Pettit in that great phrase where he said, you know, you know you have a republic. You know, what does a republic mean in, in reality? So the republic is a place in which we can look one another in the eye without reason for fear or deference. Right? We can all look each other in the eye. You don't have to be afraid of anybody else, and you don't have to defer to them because you, know, you think they have some kind of power over you. And that, that goes for every form of human interaction. Right? So it's about how we behave towards each other. It's about the relationships between the genders. It's about how we value difference, how we include people in our society. But it's also about economic equality. You cannot have a republic in which people's basic economic condition uh, is, is drifting apart to the degree to which this has been happening in Ireland and throughout the Western world. Social democracy does not propose that it is possible for the state to impose absolute equality on everybody, an absolute equality of condition. It may be a nice idea, but we know that there are costs to be, to, to be paid if you build a state which tries to say everybody must have exactly the same income, live in exactly the same way, have exactly the same aspirations. What social democracy says rather is that freedom, human freedom is based on people having a floor underneath them. Social democracy is about the ground on which we stand, it's not about the ceiling towards which we aspire. Right? Social democracy says every human person has the right to be different, has the right to have their own aspirations, has the right to express their own talents and their own views. It's not about imposing anything on anybody. But it is about saying that this is a delusion, and a cruel delusion, if people don't have a ground on which to stand. We have to be able to feel the ground underneath us in order for us to be able to express ourselves as individuals. And that's really what social democracy says in a really fundamental sense is that this is what we need to give people. We need to give them the ground on which they can stand so that they can look everybody else in the eye. They stand on that same level. And you cannot, in those circumstances, tolerate an increasing drifting apart of society in which you have a 1%, which is, which is increasingly wealthy and powerful and oligarchic, while the 99% is, 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 in different ways, drifting ever further into insecurity and into fear. Um, and this brings us back to some of the basic things about what has happened in our own society. Um, I think one of the things that social democracy addresses in the Irish context is the huge gap between our sense of ourselves and who we really are. Our sense of ourselves is that we're an egalitarian, decent, warm, intimate society in which we look after our own, you know, if you, if you use that kind of phrase. It's one that resonates with people. 
And we've seen in this year, the centenary year of, 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 of 1916, that the Republic, that idea, resonates very deeply with people. It has a real emotional, political content. It matters to people. And people have embraced that, I think, in a, in a fantastic way this year. But then you look at what, what's the content of our politics? What's the content of our way of governing? Does it at all match that sense of ourselves? Uh, just this week, the Bertelsmann Foundation in Germany, uh, it produces a thing called the Index of Social Justice, which is a really very rigorous measuring of social justice across each Euro European Union country, the 28 countries of the European Union. Um, and if you look at it, in Ireland it uses six different measures of social justice. Ireland's not in the top 10 on any one of them. Overall, it's 18th of 28 countries. In, in some areas like educational equality, for example, we're really miserably bad. There are, there's a whole set of areas in which uh, the reality of Irish life is completely at odds with our aspirations as a people. And then you have to ask, why, why is this? Why has this gap been allowed to develop? And it's been allowed to develop for a very simple reason, that we are one of the very few, certainly Western European countries, that has never had a consistent period of social democratic government. We've never built the institutions. We've never built a national health service. We've never built a national education system, for God's sake. We, you know, we're one of the few w developed countries in the world that does not have a national system of education. Uh, we've never actually um, consistently, coherently developed a housing policy, which is based on the fact that housing is a need and not a commodity. Um, you know, there's just really basic stuff that we've never done in a coherent, consistent way. Um, and uh, in a sense, this should be a source of, of, of shame to us, but it should also be a source of great energy to us, which is to realize that in this period of extraordinary challenge, there are things we can do. We know pretty much what can be done to make people's lives better. We know pretty much what can be done to give people that sense of security and belonging that alone will sustain a republican democracy. We know pretty much what the values and aspirations of most Irish people are. They are towards those very things. And I think this does give us um, hope. So we talked of fear, but there is real hope. Um, the fact is that in the world at the moment, we've allowed the worst elements to ask the right questions. The, what we're seeing with Brexit, what we're seeing with Trump, what we're seeing perhaps in, in, in many other European countries, is that the fundamental questions about why people are insecure, wh why they don't feel that they have a stake in society, uh, are, are being asked by people who want to manipulate those fears, who want to turn them toxic, who want to exploit them in order to create very, very damaging, dangerous forms of power that will ultimately do away with our democracy. But we know what the questions are. They are the right questions. They're questions about insecurity. They're questions about the failure to give people a sense of having a real stake in society. And we know, broadly speaking, what those answers are. So we're at a moment when uh, the challenge has been thrown down. It's been thrown down in a, in a, in a really aggressive, naked, toxic way. Um, but it's a challenge for which we are collectively able. We're able to meet it um, because social democracy is a proven way of building societies in which human progress happens. There has never been a period in human history in which more people have benefited more, in which more people have had more opportunity, uh, more progress from one generation to another than the period after the Second World War up to about 1979, when social democracy was in the ascendant. Uh, and there's also never been a period of greater economic growth, uh, of, of uh, the, the development of, of, of you know, real possibilities of, of, of uh, economic, social, and personal progress for people. Um, and I don't think any of us thinks you can simply go back and say, let's pretend it's the 1960s again. It's not. But the challenges are the same the fundamental human needs are the same, and the fundamental solutions are the same. They are social democratic solutions. Uh, and finally, let's just remember 
the democratic part of social democracy. Social democracy basically says that you cannot actually sustain democracy without sustaining society. It was Margaret Thatcher who said there is no such thing as society. And what we've allowed to happen is a disjunction between keeping the shell of democracy, keeping the forms going, while not caring for, tending to, really taking responsibility for the kind of social mechanisms, social structures, social institutions that give democracy meaning. And as a result, we're at this point where there are really two ways for us to go, not just in Ireland, but internationally. Uh, we can either go into that dark night where democracy itself is fundamentally undermined, where a kind of Putinization of Western societies happens, where you have the big leader who gets re-elected every five years by controlling the media, by stoking up fears, by turning people on to others uh, as the ones who are to blame for all their problems. We can go in that direction and we know what it looks like. Or we can do the civilized, decent, dignified thing, which is to gather our forces towards a new set of social contracts, a new promise to people, which is that it is perfectly possible for us to begin right now to rebuild the institutions of social democracy that give people a sense that they don't have to wake up in the morning being afraid, that they can wake up in the morning feeling hopeful for themselves and for their children. Human beings are remarkable creatures. What they will do if they feel that life is going to be better for their kids is astonishing. People will sacrifice, they will work, they will put up with very, very difficult circumstances if they have hope, if they have that sense of a, a real trajectory. What's happened at the moment is they've been given a toxic substitute for hope. The task is to give them the real thing, and we know what the real thing looks like. It looks like dignity. It looks like the democratic promise of equality. It looks like social democracy. Thank you.